So, Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity again that you gather us together to turn to you and look to you and just trust in you and learn from you as our teacher, our guide, our pastor, and our shepherd. And we ask that you would continue to bless each and every one of us. Thank you for having us uh, be in you and through you. We have our being and our life and our ability just to even think and breathe and know who we are is because of you. So we thank you for uh, bringing us from your mind's eye, if you will, and your, your thoughts before time to realization in the flesh through physical birth and then also through spiritual birth, making us one of your spiritual uh, children in Christ and then raising us up to a level of understanding that you have at this time. Continue to bestow upon us more and more and grace and love and mercy and truth, and we just thank you for it all. We thank you that we see in the Apostle Paul that you've done similar things in his life, and we ask that we continue to learn as you moved in and through his life, and as we learn and look back to this book that he has written, that you keep each and every one of us, and bless and direct and encourage each and every person and family and member of the extended family of those in your congregation as you are the Father and the head of us all. We ask that you bless us, continue to keep us safe and steadfast in your will. Remember your love and your forgiveness and your restoration and your peace that you give to each and every one through all things, in all things, and by all things. They work together for good for us that are called and that love you and are called according to your purpose. So we ask that uh, we continue to show that love to you through obedience. So we come now to study your word. We know that the living word is who we look to as you that testifies within that written word. So Father, help us to learn the truth of the written word so that we would learn more about you, the living word our coming bridegroom, our Savior, our God, and our King. So we ask and pray all these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so a couple of things to uh, remind you about. Uh, today's lesson will be the ongoing study in, in Ephesians 2. One little piece I wanted to ask you guys was later on, I'll get to it, get to it later, about the conference coming up. Don't forget to remind me. Uh, I want to get some things about that. Um, but... In this aspect of the teaching, I want to get through the next phase. Hopefully today we get through chapter 2. I, I would think that we would. Um, what you're going to find is that Paul in chapter 2 is continuing to expound on chapter 1. And then he gets into chapter 3 and he begins to then teach the lesson he was going to teach. So if you really think about it, uh, for those, I always feel comforted for those who say truthfully and honestly and accurately, boy, I'm long-winded and, and you wouldn't be wrong. Um, but I feel better that I have the Apostle Paul that I can never top him. Um, you're talking about two chapters he took as an introduction, uh, which I think is hilariously funny. When you think about how people always say, I had a guy last week say to me, boy, uh, I want to be, he's a Catholic influence, he goes, I want to be with the homilies like 20, 30 minutes and I'm done. That's how it should be. And I'm like, well, okay then. If that's what you want to do with God, you know, limit him to how much he can, you know, encourage you and inspire you and, and equip you and encur encourage you to live better in your uh, life by learning more about him and his word. Okay. <laughs> Interesting, but that's the mentality we have today, and it's interesting how Paul and back then, uh, the backdrop or the um, the lead up, if you will, the introductions that Paul gave and these parenthetical thoughts he had, weren't seen as you know rhetoric or long windedness. They were seen as uh, an embracing reality of just you know they were hanging on his every word, uh, and so not that I'm a speaker like him by any means, by no means, but it just really really makes me fascinated by how the different culture mindset that we have today versus back then. Remember the Jews back then when they first would, as a young uh, boy and girl, they would be blindfolded and, and then be have honey dipped on their tongue to remind them that's the sweet taste that you should have as you desire that. That's how you should desire God's word because back then that honey was their dessert. They didn't have any desserts that we have today. That was their their, their enticement of wow, you know. So the wonderment and the, and the thirst and the zeal to learn uh, about God's word was was paramount. And, uh, and, and today we have the culture where it's, um, give me just enough to live by today and show me how it applies to my life today. Just give me little snippets, that's all we need. Or they say, uh, learn about things in general, and math, history, science, but just not learn about God's Word because that's not really factual. These are, and things like that. And, and there's always a balance in everything. Should we learn about those things I just mentioned? Sure, absolutely. Uh, but you should not have them be so paramount that they become the primary and all of a sudden God's Word becomes a distant uh, second, third, fourth, then it's just forgotten about. And it becomes what I, what I like to call a grocery store aspect. It becomes one more thing you put into your cart as you go through life. Okay, I got my Bible, but do you read it? Um, so with this in, uh, this in essence, there is a, a premise to this whole uh, process of what Paul's talking about. 
uh, the preface of our study today, is how Paul is talking about this issue, about keeping in mind and keeping stock and reflecting back as to who you are, whose you are, and where you've come from. And, and in lieu of that, I think it heightens what I just mentioned so far, and as the Lord inspires me to, to, to you know, speak to you today, I, I would say that it's, it's one of those things where, me included, all of us have to do a, a different job of how we approach um, always introspectively looking, not that you're bad, not that you're not doing right, but how we can improve our walk with God. How can we, how can we get even closer? Not to say that you're wrong or you're not in the right place, but just improve. Just who, wasn't, who wouldn't want to love the person who loves you even better? Who wouldn't want to do that, right? Who wouldn't want to love more and be improving in how we show that, how we can express that better to God? Who, who wouldn't want to do that, right? It doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you're not good. It doesn't mean you're not where you need to be. It just means that you shouldn't settle. You should be, uh, you know, happy where you are, but don't, don't, you know, be content where you are, but don't be satisfied that that's it, that God has more for your life. So with that being in mind, I'll tell you uh, another example of this uh, before we get started in, in the study is that we heard, a, a, we were in the hospital. Uh, we heard um, on Sunday, because we weren't here two weeks ago, as you remember, I think it was, and, and Charles Stanley was talking. And Charles Stanley, we all know who he is. He's not like, you know, deep, 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 but he's a good, he's a good guy. He knows the word of God and he does know some of the things about uh, outer darkness and, and judgment for, for the believer. He doesn't talk about it a lot, but he, he does know. And uh, he's a guy who lives his life um, the right way. But anyway, he made a, he made a series about, um, about prayer, and he talked about having prayer be something that was just you know, unique to your gratitude and thankfulness to God. And so that's the summation of his, of his lesson. So what it did for me is in the mornings now, instead of me just going there and talking to God and reading some Bible stuff, I just took from this guy who sure doesn't teach what we teach or speak about what we speak about. Uh, but the thing is interesting to me is God used him to impact me in the way of saying, okay, um, how do I do better in my prayer before I start reading God's word? How, how much time do I spend on just going through the thankfulness and gratitude of the things that he has already given, continues to give, and yet will give in my life? Not just me, but those around me that I love. And so speaking of Nancy being saved from, from death, literally, and coming through that. And so I start off with, with that being at the forefront, obviously. And, and there's all things like that that, I, that I'm doing. So it changes the demeanor. I will tell you this as a testimony to God's uh, love and grace uh, and, and just mercy and compassion. I haven't bitten my fingernails, for example, since the hospital situation, which is odd for me because I'm a nervous kind of guy who would bite my fingernails as a natural thing. And I haven't bitten them. It's the oddest thing. I have fingernails. Now, the one I did, excuse me, pardon me, God, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to, but that one I went, I went to town on, but it's going back now since the hospital. Um, I haven't, you know, touched that one. But, so it's just interesting how uh, that's an issue that, that Paul's bringing about in this reference. He's trying to get people to, to really remember, one, where you've come from and, and how you got to where you were, but, but the peace and the joy and, and, the, and the jubilation and the, and the exuding, overwhelming wow should just hit you with such a resonation that you should just never get over that. And it's, it's interesting because church sanity says that about your, your birth in Christ, if you will. When you first come in Christ as the blood of Jesus covers you, they think that's the wow moment. And it is. But even more wow moment is within that group of those that he gave a wow to being in testament, he then brings out of that group those who he's going to you know, put into the inheritance in the heavenlies close to him. How much more would that not be even a bigger wow? In other words, it's like being made an angel versus being made a seraphim. A little different. A little different because seraphim's all day long right there praising him 24-7. They get to see him. Their, eye, their, their wings fluttering. It, it's just amazing. So that's where he is bringing us to that sense of proximity, of closeness. And, and how much more wow should we have? We should have the definite wow. Jesus saved this, absolutely. But there's just a bigger wow we should have. That's what Paul's getting at. And he's getting at that from the standpoint of, it was intended for the Jews at first, but now you Gentiles have been involved. And now, by the way, both of you are no longer two but one. And now you both have this, this, this wow. And they're like, what? Well, first of all, I don't understand the wow to the point you're saying, Paul. Now you're saying that these other yahoos are involved too? Interesting. So that's where he's coming from when he's, getting, he's writing these letters so far. Uh, writing the letters so far, I should say. We left off on chapter 2, and, and I have a, the, I'm not going to ever erase this uh, during the duration of our study because it's the proof text of remembering who our audience is. So however we forget, because God knows that's possible, we are human, you might go back and, oh my goodness, what are we talking about? Where's, who's the audience? And so again, for those listening to me uh, online, uh, and you don't understand what I'm saying sometimes, you can go to our website, www.pfbcstudies, 
Bible.com. That's P as in precious, F as in faith, B as in Bible, C as in church, studies.com. Now, uh, I have gotten a couple of feedbacks, by the way, on, on some studies. We've been publishing the videos since January. I've gotten two. Um, hey, I like your study. I've been, I've been, I've been tuning in. Interesting. Um, okay, good. Uh, people from out of the area, and that's nice. Uh, so that, that's good. Uh, and so we've just been doing it since January. I know that it takes a while for people to recognize where you're at. We don't do any like real advertising of linking things. People just find us. And so two found us, and maybe more found us, I should say, but two found us and liked us and, and made those comments. Also, we have a person who's uh, just recently um, left a message about wanting to join uh, more information about the study. So it takes a while to get your name known out there. It's been, again, going on eight months now, going in August, eight months where we've been live. Uh, through this process, or actually end of January, or first of January, whatever it was, we did this. So, in any event, so now we go to Ephesians chapter 2 again, and the process of thought was going back to uh, what Brother Todd mentioned about going over this again and not skirting past the issue of uh, verse 3. And so, to read the context again, to remind you where we are, and, and in verse 1 of chapter 2, uh, he, he says, uh, and you being dead, or the dead ones, and that word even before that, the being, is, is actually the phrasing, the being, the dead ones. So, so he's, he's actually even emphasizing more so um, those that are before they were in Testament, they were of covenant, the Tos Necros. And, and my, my mistake last time we met was I forgot to look at the suffix of os, which has the inference of the word the should be in front of it, even though it's not printed. And so you go back to page 10 of the Diagon, and there you have the grammatical text that tells you that's what it should be, and I just didn't, I missed it. And so that was on me, and you helped me to remind myself of that. So, so he says, uh, being dead and offenses, don't, don't forget what offenses means. Offenses is, is the word that has the phrasing of falling away. Uh, I have it on the board later on here, the paraptoma, so the falling away. So uh, being dead and offenses and sins. So you see how he's mentioning two different things there. And the reason why he's saying that, uh, tos necros, because remember this, if you wonder, no, I didn't go over this before, this is new, but we wanted to go over this, I want to make sure we cover all the uh, information. So, and the faults, if you go back to uh, chapter 1, he mentions that in chapter 1, verse 7, that we have the apolutrosis through the blood of him, the forgiveness of the faults. Notice how he doesn't say sins, because sin is the harmusia, the yarmushia, which is the very essence of our core of our depravity, and the other word for fault or paraptoma is what comes out of the harmushia. So, if you were to actually, if you would actually have a Russian doll, you'd have the the, the out of the out of the sin comes paraptoma. So, out of because you can't have a falling away unless you are a sinner predisposed by depravity. If that makes sense, right? So, in other words, you can't be a rebellious child in class, a rebellious student in class. Um, it, it, well, excuse me, you, you're not going to do your homework if you're a rebellious student. So the reason you don't do your homework is because you're rebellious. The reason why you fall away is because you're a sinner. So the reason why you have this uh, paraptoma coming out of sinfulness, but here in chapter 1, verse 7, he says that we have the apolutrosis through the blood of him, the forgiveness of the paraptoma, or the release of the paraptoma, meaning we're released from falling away, meaning we don't have sin in us, so the desire to fall away has been removed. That's what he's bringing out. So it's interesting he brings out. But notice how he doesn't say, he doesn't say harmusia in chapter 1, verse 7. He says the other word, again, is mentioned paraptoma for offenses. So the falling away has been removed from us, which is the word forgiven, meaning pardon or release from us. But he doesn't mention harmusia because sin can come back into us if we don't continue to obey. However, when he's looking in chapter 2, in verse 1, this, he uses the word offenses again, but this time he says, and you being dead, the tos necros, and the offenses and sins, he's talking about the harmusia. So the very depravity of the foundational element is what makes us, us as humans, in Adam who, who, who sinned, we all sinned. So because we have the harmusia, we also have the paraptoma. There's no way that if, you, if you're a person born in sin, then you are a person in harmusia. You miss the mark. That's what it means, right? Then you also, because of that, have a paraptoma. You're falling away. The, 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 the question is, to what degree? I don't know that. That's between you and God. Now, sometimes I can see it manifested through your murderous acts, or something that's grievous, obviously, right? Like a Hitler obviously fell way away. So there's an issue there of, of that, right? But he's talking about here, 
is both these issues. So he says you're being dead and sin. Now why do you bring up both for when he says tos necros? Because a tos necros person is a person who is a brephos of nepios in the sporos of covenant, which is the dead ones. Okay, so they're of covenant, they're not in testament. So he says, in you tos necros and the faults, the falling away, how are they falling away if they're not in testament? They're falling away from the covenant of the law's commands to obey. Because remember, even though you're of covenant, you can fall away. So people always get confused, like I did, before you understand that demarcation between in testament and of covenant. One would think, well, you can only fall away when you're in Christ. That makes sense before you realize what covenant means. And of covenant means there's a law given from which you have to obey. And if you don't obey that law, that means you're not obeying that law, which means you're falling away from what you've been commanded to do. And we saw that in many occasions in the Old Testament what happened when they did. So, some restored, some judged, some both. Judged and then restored. So you have here in verse 2, he says, in which you once walked according to the age of this world. Now that means they walked in both phases. They walked first in harmusia, because if you don't have covenant, then all you do is harmusia. You with me? All you do is exhibit depravity of your sin. To have a paraptoma means you fall away. In order to have paraptoma spoken about from you, you have to be at least of covenant. You understand what I'm saying there? I hope you understand that. You cannot have faults in this interpretation or the word paraptoma imputed to you unless you at least have been made a person of covenant. So when you're of covenant, you have an obligation to obey. You do, because you know the law. The word of God is true to you. You just don't know who the Messiah is yet, right? Then you come in Testament, and then you know who he is. But in either case, in Testament, knowing that Jesus is God the Son, Yeshua, or of covenant, knowing that God is the God of the Bible, either way, what's true? The word of God. Still, still the reference point. One's just the Old Testament, and one's the whole thing but one's in Christ and one's of God. So therefore, you still have to obey. So if you don't, then you're falling away. So if you're not in covenant or of covenant, then you don't have a chance to fall away because all you do is sin. All you do is do what you're predisposed to, which is harmusia. You continue to miss the mark. Nothing to fall away from. There's no law given to you. You don't have any covenant or testament relationship with God. You're out of the loop on that. So with that being said, as we go through this, that's why he says being dead in both, and he says, and you, once, and you once walked, because at one time, Gentiles were in Harmusia, then they became proselytes, if, they, if some, some did, not all, some did become proselytes, and then became able to have a paraptoma, a falling away, from what? From the law of Moses, that they were circumcised to, like Exodus 12 and 13 said, if they want to come inside, then you must circumcise them and you must have them have the same observance of the feast days and you're to receive them as your own. So there could be proselyte Gentiles all day long. We know this is talked about from how we say that people say that's what Luke was to Paul and they say that's what other people had it in, in the Old Testament. We see the Gentiles uh, coming into the Jews. We think Nebuchadnezzar was this way. Cyrus, he says, my servant. Alexander the Great, they said, had a belief at some point on a very rudimentary level because he was a bisexual and had all kinds of issues. But he had a rudimentary belief, right, because he saw himself in the prophecy like, oh, my gosh, that's me. And they're like, yeah, that's you. And so he got kind of who bloated. Well, who wouldn't be? God's talking about you, and you're seeing it. That's pretty powerful. But he's already a king, so I digress. The point being, falling away is only for people of covenant or in testament. So when he says in verse 2, in which you once walked according to the age of this world, he's by nature allowing them to understand, even though I'm not talking about those not of covenant, I'm reminding you that that's where you could have been if you were just in Harmusia. I'm reminding you that of, as a Harmusia sinful person, you were given the ability to have a paraptoma to even have a law to fall away from. Don't forget where you've come from. Remember who you are, okay? So he says, according to the age of the world, this, all right? And he says, according to the ruler of the authority, which again is the word archon or chief ruler of the air, speaking of, of Satan. And then of the, uh, and he says, in that spirit now operating in the sons of disobedience. And that spirit operating in the sons of disobedience is the spirit of Satan, because we know that Satan has the influence, as we know, through his own demonic aspects and other avenues of fall. Remember, there's demons, fallen angels, and Satan. That's the, or, the demons, excuse me, Satan. And then, there's, and then there's these fallen angels. Then there's these demons. Fallen angels actually had a, had a body. Demons are just spiritual things that continue to take on things. 
So when he says of the spirit that operating in the sons of disobedience, I, I'm seeing that as these spiritual demonic influences people's lives. But he says here, in the sons of disobedience. Now here's where it gets interesting. At the end of verse 2, that word disobedience, left side of your margin, is the word apatheia. And I put it over here also, apatheia. And it means to not persuaded, which is those not of covenant, or refuse to believe, which is those of covenant. It means actually both of those things. Because to be disobedient means you're not persuaded by or you don't believe in. You refuse to believe. Interesting how coincidentally the Greek has this an understanding of this word being more broad. So interesting how this apatheia, which we get our word apathetic from that, I have no concern for, right? No concern for apathe apathy as well can go both ways as well, as we all know. It can be a positive or a negative application. Uh, you could say to me, um, there's a guy that, that uh, molested these girls and then murdered them. Do you, do you want to have a conversation about that guy? No, I'm apathetic toward that conversation. I don't want to talk about it. So I could be, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not saying I hate the guy. So if someone says, hey, that guy wronged you and he wants to make right by you, I'm apathetic to him. Well, that's different. That's a negative use of apathy. apathy. The other one's a positive use. I just don't want to be surrounded by, by that evil conversation about what he did. You know, let the, let the law deal with him. So one's, so one's just saying, I'm not, not going to be, you know, I refuse to talk about it. And one's saying, I'm not going to be persuaded to have a conversation with it, right? So there's, there's a difference in how we use the word apathy, negative and positive. We do that, right? And that ap and apathia or disobedience is used to say, I'm not persuaded by or I don't believe in. I refuse to believe. And when you're not persuaded by, you're not, you're not of covenant, meaning God didn't give you the persuasion, the mind to even understand. Because you can't be a person of covenant unless God makes you a person of covenant. And that's why, it's, that's why I'm applying that term of the, of the word to the of, not of covenant people. Whereas if you're of covenant, then you have the right to refuse. You can't refuse to believe unless you have, a, you have the ability to believe. And so you have the ability to, to obey and believe ongoing. And if you refuse to, that means that tells you you are of covenant. So I want to make sure you understand the sons of disobedience are both groups of people. The brethos and nepios in, of covenant, in covenant, of covenant, of God, and those not of covenant. All right? Those not of covenant are not persuaded to even understand or know or, or to even have ability to believe. But then you have those in covenant or of covenant who have, have, the, have the ability to refuse to believe in the law. So he goes on. He says in verse 3, now knowing this, now in verse 3, among whom also we all once lived in the desires which is our inordinate lust, epithumia, our inordinate lust, because epi is a, is a, is a, a it's actually, it's like a stacked upon. That's what we say, like epi, epi don't, we say um, epi is a word that has a reference to, a, like it stacks up upon. So when you say epithumia, you're, in other words, added on thumia. In other words, why it's, it's not just lust, which is thumia, it's epithumia, which is inordinate lust. So a lust would be, you know, I, I could, someone could say, boy, I, I want a new car. Okay, you're lusting for a new car. Okay. Versus someone who everywhere you look, everywhere they go, everywhere you talk to them, there's a picture of this new car where you go. We just, okay, now you're, that's inordinate. You're off, you're, you're out of the, you're way upon just the regular lusting after it. You're just consumed by it. Okay. So he says, when he says this lived in desires, he means not just a, a desire for something. He means the consumption of desire for something. Okay. You're just inordinately just, you can't get away from the desires of your flesh. That's all you think about doing. We call it being addicted, addicted to whatever it is you want to think about. That's what an addict is, right? An addict can't refuse the consumption of their thoughts. They cannot refuse. He or she, male, female, doesn't matter what gender, nationality, or whatever else you want to call yourself. If you're a human and you do this, then you have a problem with desires. Now, when you're in Christ, you have something to, to offset that. Thank God, called in his spirit and his word. But if you're not in Christ, I feel bad for you because you got no shot. You may have a chance in the law of Moses to really keep yourself in the narrow, but it doesn't help you from within, helps you from without. But if you have neither one of those, you got no chance at all. You're bad news. Even if you're of law, you don't have anything to give you any redeeming thing. It just makes you look better and, I guess, a little bit feel better, I guess. But he says, uh, so he says here about the desires of our flesh, performing the wishes, and that's the thalimata. In other words, the wishes, as a result of where you are in your life, as a result of 
who you are in your life as a result of these consuming desires. In other words, if you're in a place where food is the issue, you're consuming doing everything you can to get food. Murder, exploitation, lie, cheat, steal. Wherever you're situ as a result of the situation that you're in, you will be consumed with whatever that thing is that drives you to do whatever you're consumed with. So if you were, so for example, my, uh, to get public, but my family member that had his mother tell him to sleep with his sister to learn sexuality, and then he has other brothers sleep with her too, that is, that is damnable and excusable parenting, right? But then you wonder why the kids grow up to be sexual deviants. Because as the result of that, their will was to continue to be sexual deviants, and it, it's manifested in different ways. Weirdness in marriage, weirdness in dating, or straight up freaking doodle, fornication, adultery, right? So, but it came from as a result of their environment, their, their thelimata, their, their result of their will being exposed to that, was that they were bent now on make, making more opportunities to explore that. So that's what it means by desires of the flesh, performing the wishes of the flesh and of the thoughts. So your wishes and your thoughts are different depending upon your experiences and influence and where you're placed. And of the, th the word thoughts means your understanding, your the dianea, if you see the word there, not suniemi, not comprehensive understanding, which is key to, to Paul pointing out through the Holy Spirit inspiring him to show us that it's a rudimentary understanding. You think you know, but you don't. So desires and the thoughts, uh, the wishes and the thoughts, excuse me, of, of the, it says, the, forming the wishes of the flesh, no, the thoughts. The thoughts means, again, dianea, which is the general understanding, if you remember. It's what a teleosis person has. Remember what a teleosis person is. A person who is, who is of the second level of maturity, not of the sports, of the sperma, right? Of the mysteries of God. And they grow to a general understanding. But remember, if they don't continue on, what does God call them? Remember? Moros. Fools. Ooh. That's what he says here that Dianea can give you. Dianea will give you a false reality that you're good. No, you're not. Or you understand it. No, you don't. You don't understand it like you think you do. But a lot of people in Christ have Dianea. Oh, my gosh. They think they know everything, and they don't. It's a false read because they have some general idea. Oh, I know Christ died for me, and I know this, 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 this. But then you start showing the Bible, they're like, I don't know what that means. That's what I'm trying to tell you because you you're missing a lot. So it's okay. So you go into then the last part of verse 3, and he says, and, and we're by nature, and we're by nature, which is, again, who you are, children of wrath, even as the others. So when he says children of wrath, even as the others, he means, who are the, look at the others, and as also oi lopos, loipos, oi lopos, right here, even as the oi lopos, So he says, we, we, Nepios and Brepos, and Sporos of Covenant, the Tos Necros, the dead ones, children of wrath, even as the other people that are dead, because they're oi lopos, the others, the remaining, that's what it means. Lopos means the remnant or the remaining. Who remains, when you're, if you're talking about people that are dead and offenses and harmusia, he says our offenses and harmusia, who's the ones dead in harmusia? The ones not of covenant. So he says, as the other ones who remain, in other words, I'm not even going to talk about them. I'm not talking about them, but let's just know by reality. If you guys who were of law were under deep problems with wrath, what do you think they're ending up at? Not good, right? So pretty much it's understandable that if you're on the lowest end of the totem pole and you're in bad shape, if you stayed there, it stands to reason those beneath you would be even, even worse off, or at least the same, right? So that's what he's saying. So you were chosen of wrath even as those guys. And I, I love this. It's, it's almost like, it's almost like uh, one of those favorite, my favorite, one of the favorite Old Testament, the favorite Old Testament uh, phrasings is, and it came to pass. As if to say, that's not the end of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, but there's more. <laughs> you know, so like this bad, horrible things happens, and all of a sudden, you, and the Bible says, and it came to pass. You're like, oh, thank God. In other words, there is a bright lining, silver lining somewhere. There's a rainbow at the end of that hurricane storm. Well, here in the New Testament, the phrase that people love the most is, but God. I love that. It's awesome. So he says this horrible thing about us. And we, we are pathetic. We are, we are entrenched in evil, and we're just lost and damned, and, but God. Awesome. <laughs> he says, but God, being, being in mercy, in mercy, through, and, and mercy in what way? So, through the, through the means of, what dia means, through the means of, 
through the means of as much love of himself. So how does God show mercy? Through the, through the great love of himself. It says the, the word there for that, that much is not megalos or mega, but it has the word for uh, alo or the polo or the various ways that he has love of him, the love of him. He has very manifold love in himself. He has many facets of his love we don't understand. So he says, in mercy, through the means of his manifold love, is the best way you could say that, of himself, with which he loved us. Look at the word has. He must. Right? Up here. It's this word. That's what I have on the board. And this is inspired by uh, the edification and the correction and the inspiration that was given to me by Greg and Sandy. Thank you. To say, okay, i got to put this on the board more, more clearly so we have a proof text and reference point to not get lost in the minutia of the language. So the himas right here is this word for us, which is the tos agios, okay, which is the, which is the group of amongst those in Ephesians. And again, to remind you, take a step back. Let, let's take a step back. I don't want to keep on repeating, but it's always good to review. So Paul's writing to the whole book, uh, whole record of Ephesians, but is, is he writing to just a, a, a building in Ephesus? No, because there was people in Ephesus that did some church planting, as we call it, and they had other people in the region. So Paul's talking to a region of peoples that meet in this region of Ephesus. Number two, is Paul talking to everybody who's the same in spiritual condition? No. How do we know that? Because Paul, how do we know the first part of it, by the way, that it's not just the one place in Ephesus? Because remember how people used uh, just common sense and said, wait a minute, if in Ephesus there was this temple of, of Dinah that was supposed to be used there as the one of the seven wonders of the world, but back in Paul's time it was the wonder of the world, why would he not make any mention of it whatsoever? If he's talking just to Ephesus and just that area. And other reasons why he says that is because he mentions two in the beginning of first, that's, that's a non-biblical reference as to why. The other, but it's not in the book of Ephesians to this temple of Dinah. But there's also a reference to the fact that he says to the saints in Ephesus, to the Tois Agios, and to the believers. So therefore, there's two different groups of people that he points out too. So he says the points in Ephesus. In other words, as if to say, he says those there, as if to say there's other saints elsewhere in the region, not just in Ephesus proper. So the second point is, is the audience just one group of people? The answer is no, because the first verse, again, de deliberates the two. But let's get into history of the book of Acts. How, how, do we, how, do we, how do we see that in the book of Acts from what he wrote about? Because remember, he went there first, then wrote the letter. So remember here, he, he says, he's, he tells you, we, we're talking about how he, the ones he taught for two years in Tyrannus, Acts 19.10, they had a specific daily tutoring from Paul, like into a seminary. But he was in Ephesus for three years total, which means the others... Remaining disciples, for, for, for one year, Paul was teaching in Ephesus, was a general teaching, it wasn't daily. They had to hear, they hear from him from one day, maybe two, maybe a week, but it wasn't every day for two years. So therefore, the teaching over here for one year was more general, Acts 20, 31, to the, to the again, tos agios, to the believers, to the, the pistos, right? I should put that here. I don't want to... Sorry, let me put that on the board here, too, so I can... Uh, let me see it. I'm going to write it the right way. Yes. Even though the word toys is not there in the peace toys, it's supposed to be inferred because of the suffix at the end of peace toys. O-I-S infers that toys is supposed to be there. The grammar just doesn't include it, but it's, it's there in the, in the language. Okay, so it's toys agios, toys peace toys. So remember we talked about, well, are these the faithful ones, the peace toys? No, you can be faithful in many things, but not be the faithful ones. Remember, there's a difference. So, with that in mind, we see the two different groups Paul's talking to. So now going back to Ephesians 2, when he says, But God, being rich in mercy on account of the much, or the manifold love of himself, in which he loved us. Who's the us? The specific us who has been given the greatest insight into the mysteries. Those who have been procured to be achieving that level of the bride. Now, how do we know that? It goes back to chapter 1 as he emphasized who the us is. The us is those who are being betrothed as the bride to then experience the actual consummation as such. So the best way to say it is don't say the bride, say the betrothed bride. It's almost like saying, calling somebody your wife that you're engaged to. It's not the same thing. That's why in the book of Matthew and Luke, it calls Mary Joseph's betrothed. 
because it means that they hadn't been married, but they were going to get married, right? So it's as good as marriage, by the way, in the Jewish mindset, but just like us, when you get engaged, you, you, you're pretty much committed to that person. It's a matter of waiting the ceremony and the day. So when you say betrothed bride, though, it puts emphasis on the day out ahead still. You're not saying, I am the bride. You're saying, I'm betrothed. I'm set apart to be that, but you're not that yet. All right? So that's what Paul's talking about. So when he says here, also in verse 5 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, he says, so he loved us, and he says, and being us, the dead ones, now watch now, he doesn't say the harmusia, he says being dead ones in the faults, you see, and the, and, the and, and the paraptoma. He doesn't say the paraptoma and the harmusia, which he said earlier in verse 1, because in verse 1 he was including those who were not of covenant as all those who are sons of disobedience. And where they've, we've all come from, harmusia, then paraptoma, then we're freed from that. But now he's talking about those of us who were in the law who were falling away, dead ones in the, the paratoma. He quickened us together in Christ. So he brought us out of being disobedient to the law to be in Christ. And he's talking about himself, by the way, because wasn't Paul disobedient to the law? You say, well, no, he wasn't. Sure he was, because he was actually looking at the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law, which is why he took that same law he knew and educated people who were Jewish to understand what the law was to be, which is why in Galatians he says it was a tutor. I understand now finally what the law is. It was a pedagogue. He took it as the teacher, the teacher. He goes, and, and he realized, huh, uh, I was wrong. God's the teacher. The law is God's tool. The law is a tool, not the teacher. The teacher is God. The law is a tool. A, t a tutor is a tool to help you understand what the teacher is saying. And so there's a difference there. And so Paul's saying, boy, oh boy, isn't that wonderful that he made us alive together. So let me see here. He made us, so us, the dead ones, so us necros, and our falling away, he made us alive. Suzopeo, he made us alive together. So now he's pointing out, I don't care if you were of Armusia and you got to be of law and now you're struggling with Paraptoma, I don't care if you're a Gentile or a Jew. I don't care if you're a Brephos or an Ephios. God took us all and made us alive together in him, did he not? They go, yeah, I'm kind of noticing in Ephesus, remember, there was already an establishment of Antioch as the first mixed congregation of Jew and Gentile. It was two-thirds Gentile, one-third Jew, for a matter of fact. First time it ever happened, which is why the interesting missionary hub was Antioch, because it represented what the future was going to look like a dominant Gentile congregation in Christ. However, in Ephesus, there was a mix there of Jews there and Gentiles, and he's making them all aware, God didn't care where you came from, whether it's Paratoma or Musia. He made us all alive together in him. Together. Together. He's bringing up this issue of the one new man without saying it, which he already said earlier. Or excuse me, he's going to say later. Um, he, said, he alludes to it a little earlier and for chapter 1, but he's going to say it much later here in chapter 2. He's going to make it real clear. Then he goes in and he goes on and he says in verse 5, So he quickened us together with the anointed, or with, that's not in the, that's with the anointed. By favor you are having been saved. Now, you having been saved is both salvations. Because he's talking about the salvation, where they've come from, but also, which is number two, in Christ, because the salvation in Christ is what's been talked about here. But he's talking about having been saved in Christ, being, 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 again, quickened together, being made alive together. But he's also talking about being made alive together to walk in the spirit of Christ, to bear forth the fruit, as when he first traveled and gave them that news that enabled them to bear fruit, to at least be heirs of earth. But now he's following up to let them know, don't stop with just being made alive in Christ. Don't stop with me educating you into understanding what inheritance is about. Go to the next level of inheritance, not just having that of the earth inheritance that the Jews are really kind of settling in on. That's what they're used to. I want you to seek the heavenlies like Abraham did, a builder and city who was not made with man's hands but from God, right? So he's talking about salvation 2 and 3 here when he says you have, you have been saved. You've already been put in a position in Christ, and you've also been put in a position to know what heirship is of, of these things. And by the way, he's going to speak to that a little bit later on here about these the, the third salvation of inheriting the earth, because he's going to bring up the covenants of the Jews, which brings into mention inheritance of the earth. We're going to look there a little bit. So in verse 6, he continues on and says, We're raised up together 
or Sunigiro, which I put on the board for you, raised together, and he seated us together in the heavenlies and anointed Jesus. So that, it says that Ina, which is so that, he may point out, the word is exhibit, prove, or to show. In, point out when? Right now? No. Look why. What he's saying? In the ages, those. In tois aeonios tois. In other words, those ages there. The ones out ahead, man. The specific ones of seven and eight. Coming. The surpassing wealth of the favor of himself in kindness toward us in Christ. So he's telling you that we have been saved in Christ, have been saved to be heirs, but not just any kind of heir, of, of which is going back to verse 5, having been saved, but to be raised up together in verse 6 and seated together in those heavenlies, toys there, those specific heavenlies in Christ, so that, so that because of that, he may prove, show, exhibit in, the, in those ages, those coming, the surpassing, which is the exceeding, transcending, beyond wealth of his grace of himself in kindness toward us in Christ. So the, the kindness that God has in Christ is shown toward us in those coming ages and the fact that he's going to have this surpassing, exceeding, transcending wealth bestowed upon us. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Aristotle and the Dipnon, the way the faithful ones are treated as the betrothed bride, and it has the bride herself is treated when she's revealed in day eight. People will know in both dispensations what the deal is. They're going to know that is the gods of all the people on the entire heaven and earth. There's no surpassing wealth greater than those of the faithful ones in day seven, nor will there be those of the bride in day eight. They'll be the greatest surpassing wealth of God's exp exp ex exposing of his wealth upon his people will be in those people. So when he says seated in those in those heavenlies in in the ages wow. in those ages which is Day seven, as betrothed bride, and day eight, and goes far to say even those who are in the heavens are included in that wealth, and then as the bride. So when you're the betrothed bride or you're the bride, either way, you're going to have God's exceeding. And the word there, I'm going to put on the word from the board for you. So he says here, we have a, the word for exceeding and surpassing here. He says here, it, surpassing, which is exceeding, transcending wealth, he says. Which, by the way, goes back to, if you look at the, the wealth, you go back to, um, back to chapter 1. He calls it the opulence of his favor, which is the abundant wealth, the plautos. That's in Ephesians 1, verse 7. He calls it the opulence, which is the abundant wealth. So it's the abundant wealth, which is, again, of his grace which is his will power to do what he wants and he says that's what the word for the, the grace it should be his, his will and power to do what he wants when he wants but it's in kindness in Christ Notice how he just didn't say in Christ. He could have just said in Christ, but he said in kindness in Christ to point out that it's his, it's, it says the, the goodness and gentleness. This is the, good, gent, the goodness could be interpreted or gentleness 
in Christ. So what the Lord's pointing out is the Father is involved as well. It didn't just, he didn't just say in Christ. He said the wealth of his favor of himself in, in kindness toward us in Christ. And of course, Christ is the embodiment of the Godhead, but the kindness is the character trait in the Godhead that God wants you to know that the gentleness and goodness of the kindness is the Godhead's character trait that's exhibited in Christ. So when you think of kindness, saying in kindness in Christ, the reason he has two ends there is to reference, to reference the character trait of the Godhead that's exhibited in Christ. Don't just think it's Christ's kindness, whereas the Father's standing back going, yeah, I don't really care. Give me a break. It's the Father's kindness too. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's our, our kindness. It's our goodness. It's our gentleness that's in the person of Christ, God the Son. That is why we are the us who's been benefited with this exceedingly abundant, transcending, exceeding wealth. And so, I mean, even me saying this, I, I find myself um, not qualified. This is crazy. So what he's talking about here is insane to me. It, it, it's, I, I can't even, it's almost like I'm, I'm a slave back in the old English days and the 13 colonies uh, tell me that I'm now a free man. I don't understand what that even means. Imagine if you were a slave back in those colonial days and you literally were free in every way. As a, as a black man being told that, even though that didn't really happen, unfortunately. But say it did, goodness gracious. I couldn't imagine that's a whirlwind of shock. And then, and then to be educated and to be equipped to be free, not just be told, but to be educated and equipped to be free, and to continue to be told the great benefits I have, that, that's just, okay, I was just getting beat a second ago. I don't understand that. You know what I mean? That's kind of what the shock here is to these people in Ephesus. It's not easy to, 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 to swallow what he's saying. And then going back and living them in the past in the days when they weren't free, when they're, they're free, yeah. it's like they're remembering when they weren't free. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to mentally to get away from those things. Yeah. It's just, it, it's exactly, it's, it's, and then they, and I say the slavery thing because they were a slave to sin. And they were being, they were being beat and bludgeoned by sin as their master. And, and it's just crazy. And it's just, I bring that up not to bring up wounds of the past of our culture, but just to bring up a, an analogy of reference to, well, how God says we're slave to sins and how, how that overwhelming aspect of how could, how, what would you feel like if you just got, you know, freed from that? Just all of a sudden, just out of nowhere. It's just, it's crazy. So Paul already gave him that understanding of, of a general idea about that when he first came there. Well, he gave him, that's in general. He gave him specific ideas when he taught them, but now he's writing it out. So it's one thing to hear somebody verbally say something, and you all, we all know verbally. Some people are auditory learners, they say. Some are visual. Some like to read it. Well, one thing is for certain. When, when a guy's dead and gone, you want to have something in writing to go back to, right? And that's why Paul, I think, one of the reasons God had him do it, because he taught them all this already. They already got taught this. But the fact he's stating it again shows, one, the importance of it, two, that the, the, the importance and the priority of it, of restating it, but also the importance and priority of putting it in writing. And the fact that he has to go over it again, it seems like he knew it was so hard to grasp that they needed to hear it again, but this time in writing. So, but as he goes into verse uh, uh, 7, I just pointed out that, as he said there, and by kindness in Christ. Then you look at verse 8, and he says, here's where it gets interesting more so. We know the verses here. It says, by the favor, you having been saved through faith, and this not from you, but the word there is, it should be an ek, but it's an e-g, because if that's the same, that's not out of you, basically, is what it should mean there, not from you, not out of you, of God, the gift, not from works, not out of works, it's not from you, but of God, the gift is, the doron, not from works, so that not anyone should boast. So I want you to understand this here. So he says, when he says in, in verse 8, which is the most famous verse, of Ephesians are one of the most famous, if not the famous verse. What you have to understand is the, the gift. How many times have you heard this? People say the gift of God. People say uh, it has to be accepted. People say this, right? How many times you hear this? In church sanity, and every sermon you hear, every revival, every single congregation that lives on the face of the planet just about will say, well, it's a gift. And if I give you a gift and you don't receive it, then you're just rejecting the gift. But God did offer you the gift. Well, that's nice of you to say that, but, but 
that's not what happened here. Let me ask you, let me, let me give you an example. If I do wrap up a present, and there is a, there is a word for this, okay? So there is a word for this, and it's called, uh, there's two words. There's the word Doron. I'm going to get to this point in a minute. And then there's the, the word uh, Dorima. So this right here, this gift, if I can spell it correctly here. This, the Doron is freely imparted. And this is given as a result of acceptance. Guess why the ma is there? Ma is a suffix in the Greek to always denote as the result of. So if, in fact, the gift, what God mentions, <coughs> which you see in verse 8, he says it is the gift of God or God's gift. It says of God the Doron. Not the Rima. It didn't say as the result of, does it? No, it says the Doron. So the gift is not the result of us accepting anything. If it was, it'd be a Dorima. But it's not. It's a Doron. Say, what's the difference, Preston? You're parsing out words. I'm glad you asked. Here's a simple question. Okay, I woke up this morning. And babe has a, babe has a gift for me on the kitchen table. She says, here's a gift for you. I don't want it. I can refuse the gift, right? <gasps> you see, you proved my point. That's what God does. People refuse. <gasps> no, it's not, stop, stop. But then I get a bleep, bleep, bleep from my checking account, and it says, and, uh, and it says, uh, deposited $1 million. <laughs> Who did that? I don't know. It says that's in there. Did I have to receive that? No. Was it given to me? Yes. Was it imparted to me without my say so? Yes. Is it a gift? Are you joking? Yes. If in fact it's real, that is, right? Right? So there's, a, there's an example of the difference. There's no, I have to, there's no acknowledgement I have to accept that. Come on, man. If, you have, if there's a way to impart a gift without having to ask for permission, you just impute it to somebody, you know, as in the gift of life. Is life, is life not a gift? People always joke and say, well, we live in the present because life is a present. <laughs> Okay, fine. Well, then, if you're going to say life's a gift, who gave it to you? God. Did you ask for that gift? Could you refuse that gift? So get real, man. Don't be ignorant. No, you, could, you didn't talk to your mom. You weren't a sperm going, I want to have that egg. You had no clue. And that, that egg didn't go, I want, I want, poof, I want that sperm. Get away, get away, get away. It didn't do that. That egg had no say-so on what sperm were going to go to that egg. And those sperm had no say so on what egg they would, they, would, they would fertilize. They had no clue. They just were organized by God. So don't give me this malarkey that you chose. That's ridiculous. So a dorima is a gift as a result of acceptance, whereas a doron is freely imparted. So those who want to give you the example and say, well, if I have a gift in my hand and you don't take it, is that a gift? Yes, but you can reject it. You go, okay, I understand that. But see, what you're talking about is a dorima. As a result of your gift, it, it's, in, it's incumbent upon me accepting it to be a gift to me. And I understand that, and I concede that all day long. However, as long as you can concede that there's a word for Doron, which means it's a gift given regardless of my acceptance, because it's imputed, it doesn't require me to be asked or for me to accept. It's just given. But do you understand that? And they go, no. Sh sure you do. Did, 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 you not, did you ask to be born of your parents? No. Did you ask to be born at all? No. Well, then that's a gift. Your life's a gift, right? Well, there you go. Did you ask for breath today? Did you have to accept your lungs to inhale and exhale? Did you actually have to think voluntarily, I'm going to inhale? No, exhale, inhale, exhale. Every day do you do that? No. It's a gift that your brain has already rewired to automatically know to exhale and inhale to have yourself have a life. Because God says, in him we live and breathe and have our being. Get that through your head. There are things that you have nothing to do with that are gifts to you you don't have to accept them. They're not, they're not asked about you. They're just given to you. How about your love from your parents? There's, the thing is, that's a bad example, but people do have to ask and sometimes plead for it. But you shouldn't have to, right? You shouldn't have to. It should be automatic, right? So there's things that you don't, you should, some people do have to ask, but you shouldn't have to ask. And some don't ask. They just give it. 
They, they get it because it's an imputed gift. Yes? Todd said you're at a restaurant and there is no check. The gentleman at the other table took care of your bill. There you go. Great example again. Great example. You didn't ask for it, nor did you have to accept it. It was just given to you. Great example. Or I, I've done that before, or you go through a toll booth and you say, hey, there's an extra bit of money for the car behind me. That, car, that guy has no idea who you are, and he didn't ask for you to do it, and nor did he have to either accept what you did. It just, it's already been given. So we know that there's a difference in our own life of how we experience gifts. We all know this. We just, we just refuse to apply that same truth to the Bible because we refuse to believe we didn't have something to do with it. You know, It's just so ignorant. Yeah, sorry, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> you're funny. So you refuse to give. Oh, what's, your, <laughs> what's your thing back there? What's what's your? Vicky said this is like God's gift offering to us. Yeah, there's no asking and no acceptance needed. So on the freely imparted, again, I'll put this on the board. No asking and no acceptance required. It's just that simple. And people understand, when you, when you understand the truth of that, and everybody knows, the example that Todd just gave, we've all been there. Either we've been the one giving it or been the one receiving it in some way like that in our lives. So to sit there and say, I don't understand. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And if you refuse to accept the truth of this, this verse spiritually, it's because you just refuse to acknowledge the truth in your own life and there's deeper issues going on with you than, than just spiritual uh, on this verse, there's different spiritual things going on about how you view God in general. Because you don't, you don't have a problem with viewing God, apparently. If you don't like God just giving you things because he wants to. It, God doesn't, think about that. If everything has to be asked or accepted in order to be, in order to be um, a gift from God, then are you trying to say to me that you have the audacity every day to wake up and say, if he stays a gift from God, did you ask to wake up the next day? Did you accept to wake up the next day? No, you just woke up, didn't you? Stop lying to yourself. Come on, man. Come on. You all, we, we all know God gives us things without us asking, without us accepting. He just gives it to us because he can't help himself. He loves us. Well, and the yes. It implies dependency of some sort, too. And yeah. a gift from somebody means that you're not sovereign. That's right. And that's the thing that people don't like. They don't like not being in control, being sovereign. If you didn't hear what Nancy said, Nancy said be giving a gift to somebody applies being sovereign. And it does. Because if I pay for someone's bill... In this case, God gives a spiritual light that implies I have ultimate power and, and, and ability to make a change in your life for the better. That's what a gift is. So you're a sovereign. You autonomously move on your own within the riches of your own to make a benefit to someone else. People don't like that, being a subordinate. Yes? Vicki said, but isn't this gift based on our faith in Christ, though? Yeah, well, so here's the thing. Again, the gift, you are say, it says, to, okay, good to your point, verse 8, by the grace of by the favor, indeed, you have been saved through faith, not from you, but it's God's gift. So you've been saved as God's gift through the faith. But then you got to go back to Galatians 2.20, and Paul tells you to answer that dilemma. People say, well, they, okay, well, it's my faith that's, that, that, that's how I receive God's gift, because he said it's through faith. You said it was imputed. Well, to Todd's point, I have to be in the restaurant, don't I? To actually have a bill, don't I? Okay, so... So in order to have a bill to get paid for by the guy in the restaurant, I have to be in the same restaurant and have a bill to incur, right? Well, guess what? So I have to have faith. Through faith, has to, that's the conduit from which God applies this gift. So, okay, well, where does this faith come from? It comes from me. Nope. Paul says in Galatians uh, 2.20, he says, I have been crucified together with Christ. Still, yet, still I live, yet no longer I, but Christ lives in me. For that life which I now live in the flesh, I am living by that faith of the Son of God, who even loved me, delivered me up on his behalf. So the faith that we have is the faith of Jesus Christ. So God gives us the faith of Christ from which to then understand and appreciate the gravity of the thankfulness we should have of the gift he's imparted to us. So the gifts imparted to us through the knowledge, through the faith of Jesus Christ, knowing who he is, is God the Son who saved us and redeemed us. And because of that, light bulb. In other words, the million dollars came to me, but then I realized 
the person tells me why. It's because of, of this. And I'm going, whoa. It grounds me in the thankfulness and gratitude as to why I got that gift. So the, through faith means by the means of, right, by the means of Christ, the truth of who he is, and, and the fact that he's and, and alive, he wakened us up, as he, as he says earlier, what's the word he uses, excuse me, in Ephesians, he uses the word suzopia, which is to make alive together. That's up in verse uh, 5. Yes. Sorry, Ben. Yeah. Pam said that faith is imputed to us. That's correct. Imputed to you, just like the gift is. They're both imputed. You don't ask for either one of them. Because back in verse 5, he didn't say, and we looked for God. He says he, he, says he quickened us in Christ. He didn't, say that, he didn't say that we asked for that. It just happened to us. And he says together, he says, he's telling the Jews and the Gentiles, we're both the same in that way. No Jew asked to be a Jew. You were just born that way. And no Gentile asked to be a covenant. You were made that way. You were God and allowed you to see the truth. That was the way it was. You didn't on your own come to that realization. Stop lying. No way. Yes. Tracy said, so is this only for Testament people here? So what about someone like an atheist? They have no faith imputed. And Vicki said, okay, so as this is where God reaches out to us, seeks us out, and not by anything we do. That's correct. To Tracy's point, so this represents the world, right? Okay? So this represents the world. Whether people are people are not of covenant, I'm going to say NOC, not of covenant, whether they're of covenant, OC, whether they're in testament, IT, all right? Or whether they're even, a, either they're, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll eliminate that person. I don't want to confuse it. How about that? Okay? It doesn't matter which person you are in this group of people. The reality is, is that, I should say, I, I, that's what I want to say, yeah. So, there's, I should have had a different thing here, excuse me. I should have had another person here, after all. So, once you're of covenant, you're of covenant. Once you're in testament, you're in testament. But a person not of covenant can be one of two people. One who God imputes faith to, and one who God doesn't. It's that simple. So you're getting involved, uh, Tracy, in a thought process that's a little different. See it the way that God sees it, not the way that man sees it. That'll help answer your question, which is God sees it as we're all not of covenant how we started, right? Well, in sin, that is. So once we're pre-sin, pre-sin, we were of covenant with ha Adam and Eve in the garden. We were all of covenant then, no doubt, before sin. However, once sin entered in, there was no covenant anymore until God came in and redeemed them. Then he made a covenant actually, I shouldn't say covenant, he made a testament because he shed blood. And he made a testament, he shed blood of the animal and covered him coats of skin. But he made a testament there. But then later on he makes a covenant with Abraham. Now, the reality is that there are some people that if you remember between Adam and Eve having Cain and Abel and then Abel was murdered and then Seth took his place and then, and then you had Enos and so forth. Then you had Methuselah, then you have Enoch in between there and, and between him and Noah. All these things came about. However, it, God didn't just choose anybody to make a covenant with after that. He chose Abraham, or Abram, I should say, from the Ur of the Chaldees. So of all the folks from the Ur of the Chaldees, did he choose all of them? He chose one guy. I mean, I, there's your proof. Well, that's, where's that in the Bible? That, where, where God chose Abram from the Ur of the Chaldees. There was obviously people living there, or else he's living by himself? No. There was a whole family there. And that's why other extra biblical books speak about him being an idol worshiper with his family. So they were nothing of spiritual people when it comes to doing the right. They were spiritual, I guess, in how we use that word, and a genuine vagueness. He's the 20th from Adam, and that letter is rich for wicked. Oh, uh, yeah, I said not know that. So, so there's two folks not of covenant. So God chooses to give one. He gives, he gives one the faith of God the Son and to the other he gives nothing right he gives nothing there's the answer to your question there, there is no so the atheist goes how come I don't have the faith of the Son of God because God didn't give it to you 
I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. But why? I, I, don't, I don't know, other than that's his decision. Why makes you better? Nothing. Nothing. I'm the same broken down fiddle that you are. The master side did pick me up, dust me off, and play me, and now all of a sudden I'm, I'm worth more than I can imagine. He left you in the closet. I don't know why, okay? Don't get mad at me. I didn't make the rules. I didn't make myself. You didn't make yourself. We're both subjected to the same rules here. We're the, we have the same master who made us out of the clay. He just chose to have me be used, and you he didn't. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. So he made some of covenant, some in testament. He gave some to, he gave some to the faith of the Son of God, and some he didn't. I, I, that's the way it is. People say, I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but that's the way it is. Let me tell you a gift story from the, the, my family. It's my, my father's mother. She wasn't in good financial circumstances, in a boarding house, separated from her husband, uh, trying to get by as an alterations lady, money wise. I mean, she was just pinching pennies most of her life, certainly by the time I was born. And my parents had gotten her some nice blankets for her bed in her rooming house. She just had like one room in a rooming house. She did not accept the gift. Oh, you all know. I'm okay. I don't need a gift from this person. And she would not accept that gift. They, really? She could have used that blanket. She probably needed it. Maybe she was cold needing and she needed that blanket that my parents had gotten her. But no, she refused it. So if you, that is pro Yeah, so here, if you didn't hear Nancy, she's saying that her parents offered a blanket uh, and to to their loved ones and here's somebody that loves them and then they said no I don't want it and you're saying it's probably because of pride she didn't want to have a so people are like that they don't want to be given something as a handout I don't need your charity type of thing they want to do it on their own um, but so that answers the question I hope uh, from um, sister Tracy but that the, the best example I can ever give to this to answer this dilemma is that say we're all born orphans from God we're, we're, we're his creation Absolutely, he's our creator. That doesn't change, no matter who you are. But being his child does change. You're not his child unless you become in Christ, or at least of covenant. So that's the very minimum you have to be of covenant to be his child in law, or in testament to be his child in, in blood and testament. So in Christ. So with that being the case, it's like a person going by an orphanage being on fire, and there's I mean, there's six thousand kids in there, and he saves five hundred and six, five thousand and six of them and 994 die. The headlines the next day don't say, horrible, evil, malicious man leaves 994 kids to die. Would you stop it already? Don't lie. The headline will read, 5,006 per se, what a great, awesome, loving man this was. Who started the fire? We did. Who gave us the matches and the fuel? God. But we lit the match. Don't blame him. It's our fault. And so when he saved us from our own stupidness, be grateful and stop trying to point a finger. Why didn't you? Hey, man, I don't know why he chose the 5,006 left over 994 to die. I don't know that. Okay, I don't know the answers. I just know that's how it works. Yes. Tracy said, "What happens then to someone who God gives nothing? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust." This is a running conversation I have in the lunchroom. Todd said, "Valley of Jehoshaphat." That's correct. Tracy said, "Only if it was Trump who saved the kids, right?" <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. That's true. They hate him so much, they'll twist that too. Yeah, but as far as, yeah, Val, Todd's got it right on the nose. Val Josephat is where you go. So those who don't have any uh, awareness of being of covenant or in testament, that they are a creation of God, uh, they are been, they're going to be raised up from under the earth, or those who are on the earth, the sickle will get them in Revelation 14, and they'll be thrown in the Valley of Josephat, which is called the Rapes of Wrath, uh, the, the Grapes of Wrath, excuse me, and it'll be something where it'll be horrific, and he will do that for 75 days. It's horrific just to think that a horse's bridles up, up to the bridles and, and that wide. Uh, I mean, billions of people will be murdered. And before they're murdered, they go on a knee and they profess him as Lord. And then he just slaughters them. And people are like, Where, where's this God at? Where's that God in the, in the book or the movie, The Shack? Which, by the way, we saw the movie. It's a tremendously great story and tremendous. It's highly... Uh, recommended for the storyline, but discouraged because of how they present God is very weak um, on that sense of it. But the storyline is fantastic. Uh, it's just unfortunate they present God. I give them like an, I give them a C. It wasn't horrible, horrible, but it wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, so I gave, them, I gave them a C minus, how they present God, but they should have done better on, uh, on that. But the storyline is fantastic. 
So it's interesting. I see how people like the book now and like the movie. But it's interesting about this whole thing we're talking about now. It's how people perceive God. How they perceive God changes how they perceive Scripture. Yes? Todd said, give Tracy the chapter and verses. And then Tracy said, then they are just dead forever, correct? After they are slain there? That, that is correct. So it's Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And for the context for you to read, uh, you will go back from verse 15 through 20. So when he says that um, another angel came forth out of the temple crying with a loud voice on the one sitting on the cloud, send thy sickle and reap because the hour to reap is come because the harvest of the earth is dry. And he sat on the cloud, cast his sickle on the earth, which it's into the earth and upon the earth and, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came forth out of that temple, which is in heaven and he having a sharp sickle. And another angel came forth out of the altar, having the authority over the fire, which is the unnamed angel who took um, the anointed cherub's place, having authority over the fire, which is really interesting who this is. And he called with a loud cry to the one having the sharp sickle, send thy sharp sickle and cut off the clusters of the vine of the earth because her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel cast his sickle into the earth before it was upon the earth, my mistake. Here it's into the earth. Uh, and gathered the fruit of the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside of the city and blood came forth out of the winepress even to the bridles of the horses a thousand six hundred furlongs off so for those who say where is it at where they get murdered that's where they go then people who say hey wait where's the where do their spirits and souls go that's so that's revelation 14 verses 15 to 20 and the other you have to go to is ecclesiastes as todd goes i'm going to give you the verses i want you to have this so write this down tracy so tracy said okay then they are dust well, yep, and then that's correct. So he, he liquefies them to their flesh. Their flesh goes, their flesh and bones are just brought to liquid and absorbed into the earth. Then their spirit's part of them, because remember, energy can't be created or destroyed. Well, it can be created by God, obviously, but it can't, once he has it, he has it. So that life force, if you will, his, his life breath, goes back to him who gave it. So that's referenced in Ecclesiastes 3, because all we're talking about so far is what happens to their body, right? But their spirit and soul has to be recognized as where does that go? And that wasn't just, it doesn't just go, in, it has to go back to God. So where's the scripture for that? Well, that's in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and you read in chapter 3 and verse 18. And Solomon says in verse 18 through 22, I commune with my heart concerning a saying of the sons of man, that God distinguished them. He searched them out. Now in order to show them, they, they themselves, that they themselves are beasts, that at least which befalleth man befalleth them, and that which befalleth the beast befalls man. The same happens to them both. See, I was comparing animals and beasts together. Remember, in Genesis chapter 9, unbeknownst to most people in church entity, God made a covenant with man and beast seven times of the, of the rainbow. As the one dies, so does the other. He compares in verse 19 of Ecclesiastes 3. And they all have one breath. What advantage, then, has a man over a beast? He says, none, for all are vanity. What's he mean? Without God intervening in you being made of covenant and testament, you're being left to, to nothing. You will go like the beast. Your life force will come back to God. And they are all returned. They, they, they are all from for one place. They were all from dust, and to dust they shall re all return. Going back to what you said, Tracy. Verse 21 and 22. And who has seen the breath of the sons of men, whether it ascends upward or the breath of the beast, where it ascends downward into the earth? So I saw there is nothing good in the works of man, but by that which he can be made glad. For this is the portion for who will bring him to see what will be after him. In other words, just like the beast. In other words, we don't see the breath of life leave an animal or, an, or a man. So he's telling you whether it ascends or descends, that's up to God, and it is what it is. So the fact of the matter is that God takes that the spirit uh, and soul back to himself because that's where it came from. Remember in the book of Genesis, how, we, how do we have life? From God. He's the author of life. He passed on his spirit through his, through his ruach. He took up the man's nostrils and and made us a living soul. His breath made us a soul. His spirit made us a soul. That's, that's wacky. His spirit, visible and manifested in his breath, then created us. His spirit then infused in us and created a soul. We had a spirit and soul now in us. The spirit that he has was then exuded through the breath, which gave us our spirit, which then created us a living soul. In other words, it created us and all the organs in our body. Were there. Remember I told you before this. 
all the organs, all the blood vessels and nerve systems were all there, but there was no blood flowing through. Because you didn't need blood when we were first made. We were animated by spirit, you know, just like Jesus was when he came back from the dead. But then when they sinned, he said that they you sin their robe, you should surely die. And that's when we took on blood. And that's why we started to die. That's why he said, you'll die that day. Yeah, no joke. As soon as you have blood, it's a matter of time. You're going to die. Yeah, I think I remember even God Almighty had blood. Oh, yeah, that's right. He died too. You see? As soon as you take on blood, you will die. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. You will die. Ask any doctor. Ask any, any nurse. Look at any science book you want to look at. Any, if you have blood, I don't care what you are, you will die. It's a matter of time. <laughs> yes? That's interesting. But, yeah, you're right. Yeah. But, yeah. I think she hated the tendency of any kind. So and pride and mother hated the tendency of any kind. And my mother was pathologically well, we, on hand. So what you're talking about, what you're talking about is people having dependency of any kind. They don't like it because they want to be able to say, if I take a gift, I want to be able to know that I could have gotten it myself, then I don't mind taking it. But if I couldn't have gotten it myself, then I feel like a subordinate and I feel like I'm dependent. A lot of people in Christ feel that way, which is why they get tied up in the law. They get caught up in that Hebraic roots movement, or they get caught up in some idiotic theology that tries to, in some way, build themselves up to act like, you see, look, this is why God saved me. Look what I have done with understanding Him. It's not about that. It's about you just individually walking better with Him and helping people understand who He is. It's not about you. It never has been, never will be. It never has been. He says, lean on him. He says, lean on him. <laughs> you say, yeah, babe. Sorry. Uh, Tracy said, thank you. I can now answer, but they won't understand. Anyway, still believe non-believers go to hell, quote, unquote, forever. Yeah, I know. That's a confusing thing there. But uh, we're going to have some, the, the spiritual growth cycle chart uh, expounded uh, and explained in writing. That helps a little bit with that. Um, but I'm going to, that helps, I said, that helps with that. Take some excerpts from that. And then also, when we get together for our conference, I'm going to give you some more input into our overall doctrinal statement, which will help address that as well a little bit. So going back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse, um, and verse 9, he says that it's not from works, not out of works either. So we know the faith is not from you. He says that the faith this is not from you. He tells you that. So that right there is clear. The faith is not from you, to Sister Pan's point in verse 8. That faith is not from you. It says that. Say through faith, and this is not out of you. So the faith did not come from you. It's from Galatians 2.20, the faith of the Son of God. So people who want to say it's by your own faith you believed, you're a liar. The faith is not from you. It says that right there if you read it correctly. Because unfortunately, people think that when he says it's not from you, they think that they, that means works. No, it means the faith's not from you. So in verse 9, he says, and it's not from works either out of you, so that no one should boast. And that word for boast is hold your head up high, because the word is is high with that word um, that word is that word is to elevate, and the other one is for is for your for your head. So it has the idea of holding your head up high. In other words, pride and arrogance, like you're talking about. It says basically the whole pound your chest. Look what I done. If it wasn't for him seeing in me the opportunity, if I didn't figure it out, it was not worth it. No, 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 no. You didn't have nothing to do with it. There was no extrapolation of of you measuring things out, of you contemplating things out. God gave you the faith, God imputed to you a gift, and that's why you are who you are, or that's why you are who you're not. So it is what it is what it is. And so it isn't like Monopoly. You get to choose your piece. I want to be the thimble. God says, you're the thimble, <laughs> you're the shoe, <laughs> you're the hat, okay? You don't have a choice. He, it's his game, okay? It's his world. It's his rules. He imputes the pieces in place, and you just play by his rules. You don't want to play and get mad and throw the board up in the air? Have fun doing that. Nice, nice talking to you. I don't want to be around you, and God has words with you about that. That's not nice. So then he says you shouldn't boast, so you shouldn't boast, right? Then in verse 10, interesting here, he says, Of him we are a work, and the word work there is poema. Love this. It should say workmanship. In some translation it does say this. That's the proper translation. Because poe means to work. The poema means the result of your work, because the word ma is the result of. This is a perfect example of how the word, how the suffix ma deliberates what it means, as the result of. As a result of work, that's your workmanship. So I would say, I'm working on, on my cabinet. 
<sighs> and my wood cabinet. I'm done. My poe my poia, my poia is my is my working on the cabinet. I'm done. That's my poema. That's my result of my work. That's my workmanship. Right? That's what God says. So that means we're a finished work. That's crazy. When it comes to being who we are. In this context, those he's talking about are those who've been verse five, quickened together. Verse six, been in the heavenly, seated together and raised up together to be put in that place to have the surpassing wealth. So that now we can say in verse 10, we are his workmanship. So who's his workmanship specifically? All of us in Christ? To be technical, no. These people, the tos agios, the people that are specific, not just, uh, but not just all of those, but the, these us, these, these 100 fruit people specifically. He's talking about the aneers, the highest you can ever be. Now watch this, by the way, he says, having been formed in Christ Jesus. Now it applies to everybody, absolutely, in Christ. But he's specific to, to those who the, he must, who have this great blessing of being the betrothed bride. And he says in verse 10 again that we are his poema, his workmanship, his work. Having been formed, having been formed, he made us in Christ Jesus, epi, or for works, unto works. What kind of works? Agathos, in which before prepared the God that in them we should walk. So that means, again, having prepared beforehand, that means proatomazo, which is appointed beforehand to walk in, which is to conduct ourselves. We should conduct ourselves from how we've been ordained to walk. Interesting. But go back to, to walk in what kind of work again? An agathos work. You see that in verse 10? He's prepared us in agathos works. Remember before we talked about what agathos works mean on the conference last year from Kalos works. An agathos work is God inwardly changing one's disposition of your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. How you view the world, how you see life, how you view God, how you understand God, how you see the Word of God, how you see yourself, how you see each other. Your views and vantage points and perceptions and paradigms and your entire internal disposition is your agathos work God's making in you. You say, well, that makes no sense. I'm going to show you in Scripture where that's all true. And by the way, that's why out of the agathos work comes a kalos work. Because now you're manifesting, you're applying what it is that you have internally been renovated or restored or recreated in you, as David would say, create me a new spirit, O God, right? So there's a, a steadfast spirit in us, right? So he renovates us continuously for agathos works internally so that externally the kalos works just come flowing. So what's more important, agathos or kalos? Agathos. Without agathos works, you have no shot of doing Kalos works. No shot. So people always say, well, that's why some people, I, I was at a, when we were in D.C., I had a friend of mine from work, and he says, all that matters is, 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 knowing, is knowing Jesus. My, my father once said, you got on a plane, you don't have to know his, his, his degree. You don't have to know how the wings work. You just have to know where the plane's going. And as the pilot's over, I guess at best, he's done. Do his thing. Everybody believes what he says, but no one wants to believe what God says. They believe that. They don't question him. They don't question his pedigree or nothing, but they question everybody who says anything about the Bible. He says, it's funny how people believe in a pilot without knowing who he is, but they don't believe in the Bible that's been around for longer than him. Good point. So he said, the net result is, all God wants you to do is just believe. As long as you do that, you're fine. I said, okay. Let me ask you this question. If I believe a gun can shoot and kill things, and I believe that hunting animals and needing to survive off the land, if that's all I had, was necessary to live, and I believe that animals can actually sense me coming sometimes by smell, by sight, and by other things, then I guess I'm qualified to go out and hunt right now. I believe all that. Can I go hunt? No, I can't. I've never shot a gun in my life as an adult, and I don't know how to hunt, and I wouldn't know the first thing about looking for a deer or a turkey or anything else or a boar. I don't know, man. I'd be, I'd be starving a long time before I got anything to eat. So the point is I got to learn how to hunt, how to work a gun, how to sit and do the things where they understand where they go and all that kind of stuff, and how to gut the deer when I do kill them, if I do get a good shot. How do I gut them and eat? How do I prepare the food? I don't know all that stuff. I don't know. I still, you can't say, you know a gun? You ready to hunt? No, I'm not. I just know there's a gun. I know it's necessary. I don't know all the rules. So the same works for spiritual truth. I believe in Jesus. Great. 
But do you understand all the rules? What rules? He called them commandments. He did say, if you love me, keep my commandments. I didn't say that. He did. Do you know what those are? No, i got to believe. That's not what he said. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, I don't know what those are. Well, spend time in the book. What book? The Bible, dude. And they go, well, well, it's a lot to learn. Exactly. Just like it is to learn about the, about the different kinds of guns there are, different bullets there are, different kind of animals there are, different kinds of places in the country where you can hunt different animals, how the weather changes things, uh, all that stuff, how to prepare an animal, how to cut it open, how to cook the meat. Yeah, you're right. right? All that you learned is also a lot of stuff too, isn't it? Okay, then. If you want to learn, what do you do? You take the time. You, you, you invest the time. If it's valuable enough to you and you desire it, then you do it. It's that simple. So if it's not valuable to you, you don't desire it, you won't do it. So don't lie to me and act like, no, that's just your way of trying to excuse your fact that you're not, what you really want to say is you don't value the Bible, nor you desire to learn about it. Which means that the other issue that's really overarching is, why is that? Because you believe it's a book written by men and it has fallacies in it. You don't hold it as that important from that it's God's inerrant word. You actually think that there's errors in it, that it's flawed, that it's interpreted, that it's misread and all this kind of stuff. That's probably what you're thinking, which caused you to not value it and not desire it. And that's why you don't want to learn it. And that's, what, that's that simple. So, and anyway, I digress. But going back to the Agathos works you prepared in us, let's go, I'm going to show you a couple things here. I'm going to show you, so again, I'm putting this on the board. So the faith we have with this here, the faith we are given by the Son of God. Whoops. I was going to write God the Son so people don't ever misunderstand. I'm not talking about some, you know, other God. No, I'm talking about the God. So that's Galatians 2.20. But then, and so in verse, eight, in verse 10, when he says, we should walk and and good, this is agathos, works. I want you to go, I'm going to show you something here. So I'm going to show you, and, and you look at, look at verse um, in Colossians. In Colossians 1.9, go to Colossians 1.9. Let me show you, Colossians 1.9. Well, he says because of this, because of what? Because he says, as you learn from Epaphras, our beloved total servant, who was on your behalf a faithful servant, who also related to us your love and spirit. Because of this, he says, I said, that's 1-9. Did I say 1-9? Is that right? Is that what I said? Yeah. Okay. So he says, so on behalf, let me go back to where I was. Sorry, I lost my place. All right. What am I? It's verses 9 and 10, that's why. Okay. All right, so because of this, we, from the day we heard it, do not cease praying on your behalf that you may be filled to the exact knowledge of, the, of his will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, we know from this context, he's talking about faithful ones because of the exact knowledge of his will, the spiritual wisdom and understanding. These are things that he's talking about, Sunemi, Sophia, all Sophia, and all Sunemi. He's talking about, again, the exact knowledge, the epinosis, of people that are in that faithful one, hundredfold, excuse me, hundredfold, hundred fruit of the sperma, the aneers of sperma. Verse 10, to walk worthily of the Lord, pleasing him in all things, bringing forth fruit. You see how he says this? Bringing forth fruit. He says, by every good work and increasing in the exact knowledge of God. So left, left, left side of your margin, to walk worthily of the Lord, to all pleasing and every work good, bringing forth fruit and growing in the exact knowledge of God. So you see how he's saying you bring forth fruit out of your agathos works. So he's proving to you agathos works are the premise from which kalos comes out of. He's proving that by that verse right there as well. All right? So he's telling you also, what's he, what's he end with though? He ends with by saying, but you're supposed to and, and grow or agzano, which means to augment the knowledge in the exact knowledge of God. You're supposed to continue to add to and augment your knowledge so you can improve on your agathos works 
of learning the written. In other words, it's better to say it this way. Agathos is knowing the written word of God so that you can kalos exhibit your love for the living word of God. You see? So the agathos works are you committing yourself to learning the, the written word of God so that you can kalos live fruitful and to showing your love to the living word of God. Because Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he that loves me. Who has my commandments, agathos works. He who does my agathos works has my commandments and keeps them, kalos works, exhibiting his love for me, the living word, he loves me. Well, no joke, right? He's telling you that. So let's go back and look at also the most famous verse of all time about works other than Ephesians is Matthew. In Matthew 5, in verse 16, most famous verse of all, when people think of works, it's Matthew 5, 16. He says, Thus let your light shine before men, that they may see your kala, kala or kalos works, and glorify that Father of yours in the heavens. Now what's in view? The kingdom of the heavens. Because he's talking about, again, happy those that persecute you, the whole thing is about the kingdom of the heavens. He sat down in verse 5, and it's kingdom of the heavens all throughout this passage. It ends in verse, in verse 10. He talks about the kingdom of the heavens. He goes on to talk about that previously, and he goes into uh, let your light shine again before men so that you may see your good work, they may see your good works, your callous works, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In other words, to see your good works is your outward application or manifestation of what you have learned inwardly through your agathos works. You can't show someone your agathos works by telling them or teaching them what you know. You have to actually show it by living what you know. You just can't teach them. You have to show them. You got to show them. I mean, that's what Jesus did. Maybe so. For God so loved the world, agathos. That's his agathos works. He loves us. That he that he did. He sat back and looked at us. That he gave. You see, agathos works impute. I mean, impute. They, they lead to a callous work being done. You can't just love without giving. Love will require you to do something. Because love starts with an agathos work inside you, but then it's exhibited in a callous work outside of you, right? So that's what it means by agathos and callous. So when he says he's prepared agathos works for us, he's talking about he's internally prepared for us to be prepared for every good work internally. He's preparing us every good work internally so we can have every opportunity to exhibit callous works to the fullness of whatever it is. How, I mean, he's setting us up for success. It's almost like we would, you know, in the financial world, you call it a trust fund kid, right? They have all the reasons in the world to succeed. Then just do it. <laughs> you know, so he's given us all the reasons. That's why he says that he has prepared or proatamazo, appointed beforehand us to walk in them, that we should conduct ourselves. Because now it's not, he's already given, he, He's prepared in us, so he has been formed in us for good works. He gave us the good, he already gave us the agathos works with all this knowledge. So now he's saying, don't you understand? He gave us these good works. He's, been, he's formed in Christ Jesus, we've been formed in Christ Jesus for good works, for which God prepared us. He appointed before time that we should walk in them. We should now apply from all this agathos work in us, these callous works that should come out of them, should be automatic. They should be something that you should just want to do. They should just come up like, Thoughtless execution, I call it, right? So with that being said, we go on in verse 11, and he says, Therefore, so because of this, remembering who you are and how God's deposited you, this wonderful, ridiculously, beyond measure, surpassing, exceeding wealth to do these wonderful things, because you have this wonderful disposition he created in you. Therefore, remember, now, I like how he does it. He's like, he gives you this great, aha, wow moment, and he brings you back to earth, brings you back to earth and reminds you, the, the scum that you were. And he says, therefore remember that you were once the Gentiles in flesh. In flesh. Ah. You were much disgusting, in other words. You were always being called uncircumcision. You were of those. Those there are being called. Remember how they used to make fun of you? Remember how the Jews used to make fun of you? By that being called circumcision in flesh done by hand. That you were, past tense, in the season that Without anointed, that means without, again, meaning you're separated from. Conus, C-H-O-N-I-S, you're conus, you're separated from anointed. Having been aliens, you were estranged 
from the commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth, it says the polity on the right side, the right interpretation is commonwealth. The best I can give you on this to extrapolate, we went to Virginia once and I had to call the uh, Department of Agriculture about a gas pump having a wrong uh, error. It was, it was the, 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 the gas was pumping infrequently like that. But the ticket was going charging me. I'm like, that, that's not right. <laughs> you can't charge me constantly for an intermittent flow of gas. So when I called the Department of Agriculture years ago, they said to me, and I quote, are you of the Commonwealth of Virginia? No, I'm of this thing you might have heard of. It's called United States of America. It's a really cool idea. It's where these 50 states got together and they had the whole um, um, country based upon this, 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 uh, this constitution thing and this whole flag and everything we have to, uh, to symbolize it. It's pretty cool. I'm one of those stars. The 50 of them, but it's Florida. That's where I'm from. So. And they go, ha ha, funny. We don't help people that aren't Commonwealth of Virginia. What? But it says on the gas pump, U.S. part of agriculture. And they go, sir, here's the number you have to call. I'm like, wow. The way that felt was like I was in a foreign country. I'll tell you right now, that was, such, that was the freakiest feeling I ever had in my life when it comes to feeling like an alien in my own country. As far as, I mean, not being treated by people the right way is one thing, but not being treated by the government in a way in which is just rudimentary, like common sense. We are citizens. How can you not know that? That's just, that, was, that floored me. So it reminded me of, it always comes to my mind when I see this word commonwealth, is here they have this, this phrasing in Ephesians where he says, he, Paul's telling the, the, the Gentiles, remember, that's how you were. God didn't even talk to you. God said, yeah, I'm, you're, not, you're, not my, you're not my commonwealth. You're not part of my peeps. Whoa. It's amazing, right? You were aliens. You were estranged. And he says, and, he says of, and you were strangers. That word for stranger is xeno. We get the political term xenophobia from this, right?